Um, my name is Jasveer Singh. I'm the founding chair of City Seeks, which is a, an organisation, a, a national organisation, which uh, puts forward the uh, progressive approaches within the Sikh faith uh, and looks after the progressive voices within the British Sikh community. I'm also the co-chair of the Faiths Forum for London, which is the main interfaith organisation in London uh, and which works with the nine main faith communities. Uh, I'm also a, a barrister uh, in my day job, uh, practising family law. So um, I've been the co-chair of the Faith Forum for London since September of last year. And the Faith Forum works with the nine main faith communities in London. Those are the Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Baha'i, Zoroastrian and Jain communities. All of which have um, communities within the UK which are varying sizes. But we've, what we've tried to do is act as a bridge between those communities, to bring them together to work on social projects which have, uh, social action projects, which have uh, a strong impact upon society. And one of the ways in which we're doing that is by having regular videos on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, showing some of the work that we've been doing over the years. Now, the more recent work that we have done has been during Ramazan and uh, a number of iftars which were organised by the Faith Forum for London, one of which we had the Secretaries of State at the time for uh, departments and uh, uh, for communities. Uh, he was in uh, attendance at that particular event and it was a, a beautiful iftar. Um, we've also done a lot of work challenging some of the um, extremism that is um, sadly becoming a part of modern life. Now as part of that we've had videos which have been showing the unity of faith communities, showing how we can stand together when it comes to any adverse acts. So in particular last year with the dreadful uh, attacks in, in France, we, we came together, we produced a video uh, and that was a video which was then seen by many people around the country, including the Prime Minister. So we are doing a lot of work to show how faith communities can work together for the common good and how we need to work together if we want to ensure that um, our own communities are kept safe, but also to show all the good work that faith communities can do in society. Interfaith work is extremely important in the present climate. There is a general sense of uh, faith illiteracy within society. If you ask most people to describe what the differences are between Shia and Sunni, most people wouldn't know. But if you had asked people if they knew that there was a distinction between Sunni and Shia about 10 years ago, most people wouldn't have been aware that there were such divisions within Islam. They would have considered Islam to be a unified um, faith which didn't have divisions. We know that things are very different, that there are those divisions that exist. Um, simply, it's the, part of the diversity of the, the Muslim community. It's not homogenous, just as a Sikh community isn't homogenous. But in order to understand that there is that diversity, we need to understand faiths better. And as part of that, we need to work together to make sure that that true diversity is seen and reflected. And also, more importantly, um, that in interfaith circles, people are more aware of what other faiths are. Now, I'll give you another example. If you had spoken to the general person on the street about 10 years ago about Ramadan, um, 10 years ago, they wouldn't have had a clue. Most people had no idea about the fasting that took place. They wouldn't have known about the Eid celebrations. Now we have that on TV. We have, you know, to some extent, that being shown in our soap operas. On EastEnders, for example, you have Eid celebrations taking place. Society's changed. And part of that change has been uh, a greater awareness. But interfaith work is necessary to ensure that that awareness continues to grow so that when there are acts which are committed by an extreme minority, and they are a minority, um, that we are able to challenge them and say, it's not in our name. It's got nothing to do with faith. It may have something to do with power, and it may have something to do with intimidation and being threatening but it has nothing to do with faith or religion. And we need to make that very clear. That's why it's more important now than ever to have interfaith relations uh, as strong as we can. So the first time I became aware of uh, uh, Imam Hussain was actually when I was reading a novel, uh, and that was uh, A Suitable Boy uh, by Vikram Seth. 
and there's an entire um, section that's um, an explanation of Murram, about the uh, the ten days, uh, and about Ashura itself, which I had been vaguely aware of, uh, but I had no idea of the the context within which the the mourning took place, um, and it's it's a story which is. In a very strange way, it's a, it's a sad tale. It's a, a very sad account of what happened, but at the same time, it's life-affirming. And the reason why it's life-affirming is the fact that the Imam, uh, Imam Hussein was willing to stand up to injustice and was willing to stand up for what he believed to be just and correct, just and right. And it's something that we all need to um, value. Uh, those are values which all of us can take on board. The idea that when you come across anything which you may see, may think is um, a difficult decision or something that you think, well, actually, that doesn't seem to be right. Um, you can look to how Imam Hussein dealt with it, which is by saying, well, if it's not right, then I will challenge it. And I will not bow my head down to uh, an authority that uh, is forcing me to do so. I will do what I believe is right and correct and just. And that's something that all faith communities can can adhere to as a value, that idea of justice being universal and being something that we always need to stand up for. I like to think of the, the Shia community as having almost a natural home within the Indian subcontinent. It's the idea of the, the spirituality that comes with the, uh, the following of Islam and this idea of togetherness that's created by that. It's something that resonates with the, the Dharmic communities, uh, with the, the Hindu faith, the Sikh faith in particular. Um, and I mention the Sikh faith because there are certain similarities, which I, I'll explain um, later. It's, it's the idea of recognizing that there has been somebody who has given his life for what he believes in. Uh, and this idea that it was done because it was the correct thing to do. It was a just and right thing to do. And it resonates in a land where, in India, for example, where you have had countless invasions over the centuries, over the millennia, where you have different communities who have always been living side by side. Something that's universal will always resonate. And in the Gawalis that are sung around that time to, uh, to commemorate the morning uh, and the um, commemorations which take place on the streets of, um, of India and uh, other places in the subcontinent, it's all about finding that inner um, unity with other communities and saying, look, sometimes we all suffer, but in that suffering, we can find something that will keep us together. And regardless of our suffering, we will do whatever we think is right and just to do. And it's that belief that keeps us going. I think Imam Hussein's life is something that all people can learn from. It gives that sense of idealism, that idea that we are all equal, that we all need to be respected, but we all need to live a life of dignity. However, if it's not possible to resolve things through mere diplomacy, then you have to be willing to fight for what you believe is true and just. Because if you're not willing to fight for what you believe in, then you will never achieve what you need to achieve, which is having um, that sense of justice being felt throughout, through everyone, and for everyone to feel as though there is that sense of fairness there. If you don't fight for it, you'll never achieve it. That's a story that really needs to be explored further. And I think, as I've said, I've been able to draw some of the um, similarities between what was experienced by the Shia, um, what, 1500 years ago, and what was experienced by the Sikh community 300 years ago. There's that sense of shared history and that's that sense of having suffered and through that suffering, fomenting an identity which is about remaining true to our own ideals but willing to fight for what we believe to be true. And that's true within the Shia faith, it's true within the Sikh faith. It's something which needs to be explored further because Whilst at the time of the Gurus there was greater understanding about the diversity within uh, the Islamic world uh, amongst Sikhs, in the present time I think there's less of an understanding simply because of 
as I mentioned earlier, faith illiteracy. We know of faith communities, but we only know them as the, the great big mass. We don't know the distinctions. And those distinctions are important because it then great, gives that sense of greater shared history at times. Because there are a number of uh, Shia scholars uh, within uh, India who were contemporaries of the gurus and whom the, very, the 10 living gurus had a good relationship with. Um, there's a fact that they're the foundation stone of the, the Golden Temple, the Harmandar Sahib in, in Amritsar, was laid by Sai Miamir, who was, a, again, a, a Sufi um, scholar, a Shia scholar, who um, had a very strong relationship with the fifth guru. There are the fact that the scriptures contain the works of many um, Shias and Sufi individuals. All of that brings that togetherness of, of a shared identity, which is sometimes lost on individuals. And it isn't a case of we share the same faith, but we can share the same narrative, even if we do have different faiths that we belong to. That, I think, is important. Um, I think it's something that does still exist. And the reason why it exists is because in Punjab, for example, Punjab had a very strong um, sense of unity amongst the faith communities. You could quite easily go to uh, a Hindu mandir, uh, a, um, uh, a masjid or a, a dargah uh, of a, a Sufi saint and then go to the Gurdwara all in the same day. And it would be for all of the faith communities to be able to have that. Um, it wasn't a fluidity of identity. It was more just an idea of respect for not only one's own faith, but those faiths of one's neighbours, and also the idea of any shrine being a place of worship, regardless of which faith you belong to. There was that sense of um, unified identity that existed in Punjab, which sadly, when partition occurred, um, things changed. Having said that, there are still places which are um, the tombs of various um, uh, Shia saints, Shia scholars that are in Punjab that Sikhs are still, the 10th Guru for example has ordained that Sikhs should, before going to a very particular Gurdwara, they should also pay their respects to the Shia saint who is buried nearby and uh, I believe at the time he was still alive so it was a case of saying well you can come to my place of worship but before you come here you also need to pay your respects to this person over here because he is somebody to be respected. You may not necessarily agree with his faith, but he's still somebody that you should listen to and learn from. And there has always been that idea of we should learn from each other. We may not agree, we may disagree on many things, but we should make those attempts to learn. I think as part of that, there is also the shared narrative of, uh, of martyrdom and how having individuals who have um, died for the sake of their own faith, um, having those figures being commemorated in one, one way or another um, means that it gives greater strength to the identity of that particular faith community. Now, I've mentioned the, uh, the four sons of the 10th the Guri, uh, and there are massive commemorative uh, fairs that happen in India at the places where the, the four of them um, gave their lives. Um, and in, in a way, it's very similar to the, uh, Imam Hussein and the commemorations which take place for Ashura. It's the idea that somebody who was just and righteous died, somebody who had strong ideals, strong values uh, about justice and fairness, um, who wasn't willing to fight for what he believed in, and yet that person died in, in those beliefs. I would say that's why Sikhs, to some extent, do respect Imam Hussein and do participate or do attend the, uh, the commemorations, even if they're not actively participating, they may attend. Um, and it may also explain why Iraqi Christians attend. There's that similarity within Christianity of Jesus and Jesus being martyred, Jesus giving his life to save humanity. So there's that shared narrative of martyrdom which brings those faiths together closely and which makes it easier to understand that faith community when you look at it from that perspective. I think what we can learn 
from Karbala is that when, when the time comes to stand up for what you believe in, you have to be willing to give everything for it. If you don't do that, then if you lose, and if you don't achieve what you want to achieve, you'll only have yourself to blame. If you want to be able to say, well, I gave it my all, I gave it everything I could. Um, if you want to have that sense of having put everything into, into whatever it may be that you wish to be doing, then you need to be willing to give everything for it. And I think that's one of the things that you can learn from, from Karbala. Another thing is that the idea of justice and fairness. That's universal. The idea of if you want to be fighting for what you believe in, and if you want to be, if you are willing to give everything for it, then you need to have that frame of mind of being willing to sacrifice everything. It's only when you reach that stage that you know you're truly at the position of doing or emulating what Imam Hussein did. And as I said earlier, what Guru Gobind Singh Ji did.